welcome to Payment Talks. I'm Peter Turners, and together with Andava, we are diving headfirst into how companies are shaping the future of payments. Together with our network of experts, we discuss uh, strategies and innovations in payment technology. Uh, on this episode, uh, we have Guy Mons, the International Solution Head of Solution Consulting in FIS. Um, subject today is cross-border payments. Cross-border payments is one of the most growing uh, areas in payments globally. Uh, the idea is that it tips this year about $156 trillion by the end of the year. Now also, there are a number of uh, opportunities and risks in the coming year to come, and uh, these challenges we want to discuss with them. Good afternoon, Guy. Uh, can you please introduce yourself and FIS a little bit? Hi. Hi, Peter. As you already mentioned, I'm running the international solution consulting team on our enterprise payments platform. And uh, within FIS, we are responsible for all the implementations around account to account transfers, both domestic and internationally. FIS is an international organization of about 75,000 people. We call ourselves the biggest fintech in the world. Though we exist for more than 50 years, we have a wide span of services that we offer to the financial industry, both in the banks and also the processing of transactions. Okay. Now, Guy, you are already many years an expert in, in cross-border payments and payments in general. What did you see over the last five years, the biggest evolution in, in cross-border payments? Well, if you step back five years, then you can say at that point in time, payments, certainly cross-border payments, were still in the space where there was a lot of friction. Um, doing a payment was a cumbersome exercise. You sent money and then you had to pray that it arrived on the other side on time with a good value. And then you saw a certain shift in the market, mainly driven by fintechs. We all remember the ripples of this world, who wanted to make it faster, more transparent, cheaper. And at the same point, we saw a counteraction of SWIFT with its GPI, the Global Payment Initiative, where they try to bring it back home by offering similar or even better solutions to the banking industry so that they could take back the center stage of the payment interactions. And then more closer to now and the near future is where we see now the shift to ISO 2022, which actually for me is like the closing uh, the circle on payments because we have already seen ISO in all the other payment types, yeah. real time, batch, now high value payments, and then cross border payments. So that means that with one set of payment data, you can actually service all your transaction types. And there you see that in that evolution that everything gets more concentrated, consolidated, transparent, and would make it easier to process payments more yeah. transparently. And with all the feedbacks that are now happening in the system, I think a better service to all the participants. Okay. Now, now this ISO 2022 migration uh, project, as they say, uh, it is pure a protocol. It's a way of transporting data from point A to point B, um, to my idea. Um, what is for you the biggest value that it will going to bring to the market? Uh, as today, we also transfer already this data from point okay. A to B. I think I disagree with the fact that it is just a format and a protocol. Yes, of course, it is transporting data, but what's more important, ISO 2022, as we often refer to it, is not a format, it's a business language. It allows you to interconnect the different pieces of the puzzle in a more natural, transparent manner. And what does that mean? I can give some examples. If you need to transfer, do a payment, you would like the other party to know why you're paying him. So what you typically do is you put a an invoice reference to that payment. That all works fine if that in that reference is no longer than 16 characters today, then or if it is longer, then you will lose already data, and then the party on the other side has difficulties in matching the two. Yeah. If I then take an example in uh, in APAC where we had to introduce QR codes in international payments, well, good luck to fit a QR code in a traditional payment. So from that point of view. Yes, the format matters, so more transparent, more uh, data in a format helps. 
But the more important thing about the ISO format is that it's flexible. I yeah. can on the fly add a series of fields to my message without disturbing the process. Yeah. And that's important. So that makes it open for innovation and will trigger new innovative uh, uh, protocols. Okay, yeah, that's that's interesting. But does it then also serve the idea of more clarity at the end of the day, uh, more of transparency on pricing? Is that how how can that be achieved with that? Well, it's not only with eyes that you can achieve that. It's more with the the process around it. If you look at GPI, for instance, from Swift, um, when I send a payment as a corporate to my bank, uh, I can ask my bank to send me back. Like, what was the exchange rate that was used? Yeah. When was it posted in the account of the beneficiary? Uh, what were the costs that every party on the uh, project has taken from my money? And I can get that on a step-by-step -step base each time that a step happens. I see who's taking money for this. So yeah. that transparency will become much more prevalent. Yeah. And having these, the, and this is not to do with ISO. This is more to do with the processes around it like GPI. Yeah. Okay. Now, now again, you see this is a big transformation. I, I said a little bit to, to tease you a little bit. It's, it's, it's only a protocol, but uh, it's, it's much more. But you see again that this big transformation causes quite some impact in banks and, and, and organizations. Um, what do you see today? Because you're much closer with that, Mark. What is the readiness state status of the banks taking in account uh, the recent uh, announcement of ECB and SWIFT to delay, let's say, till, till March next year, uh, the start of the migration? Well, as we all know, delaying something for a launch of a new product in a banking space very often also gives the opportunity to postpone. So yeah. I would certainly urge the banks not to see this as more time, but just more times to test rather than more times to develop. However, if you look at this, it is a big transformation program. Uh, when I talk to banks, I see that they're all working on it, certainly the big ones, but sometimes I see that they're also making inventories and I say, hmm, you should have done that like three years ago. Uh, like a typical bank of a uh, of of size, they have between five to ten payment systems, roughly, but they have also between fifty and one hundred systems that are depending or feeding that payment system. What does that mean? That means that if you're going to introduce ISO 2022 just as an interbank protocol, yeah. then you're only doing a very small piece of the puzzle. But if you embed ISO processing also in your payments processing and into the payments value chain up to your end customer, then you potentially are going to touch between 50 and 100 systems. So then it doesn't come down to a simple like I put the converter in front of it and everything is done. No, then you are going to a profound transformation program. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, now, now, taking it from another angle, uh, last year there were a lot of fintech that, that came into this cross-border uh, space. And how I see it, they mainly played on the, the last mile, going back to the end customer or to the end corporate. Uh, but at the other end, it's, it's also somewhere a competition uh, for the banks. How do you see this evolving? How competitive are these fintechs for banks? Um. I think it's a, it's an end or it's an end uh, story. It's like these fintechs are very often created to solve a particular problem, and this particular problem is very often then uh, articulated around one small uh, fraction of the financial value chain for a particular type of end user. Why? Because typically the people who created that fintech came out of that area and saw a need. So what does that mean? That means that for these uh, fintechs, you will see that in the beginning they, they, they create a lot of cloud and noise, but very often you see that uh, a lot of them are missing the steam to go the long mile and to, to uh, get bigger and uh, acquire uh, enough footprint to be su sustainable. Yeah. We, we do see those as well, like you see TransferWise and others that have been able to grow significantly, but a lot of these uh, 
in this fintech world, I would expect to see a lot of consolidation in the coming years. People have a good idea, they build something, they launch it, and then they miss out the steam to go bring it to a, a bigger uh, market share, and then they will consolidate or disappear. No, no, that's true. I mean, uh, time that that investors only invest just for the the the, the PowerPoint story is over. I think now the the yeah. EBITDAs need to be made. So I think that's one of of the things that that we will see the coming years. Um, now going to a totally other subject, uh, CBDCs and 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 cross border payments is is one of the things where a lot of people see now something in the future and 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 how that will be implemented. How, how do you, how soon do you see to become on this real CBDC projects, big ones coming to real realization. Well, as you know, uh, at uh, FIS, we also have a team that is busy with uh, CDBCs and all that kind of stuff and uh, introducing it to uh, market infrastructures and uh, helping them shaping it up. Um, when we look at it, I think CBDCs for me have more future than I would say the traditional bitcoins of the world. Yeah. Um, we have seen recently some interesting evolutions with a few of those uh, marketplaces. Depending on you stand, it's interesting or a drama, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but the thing is, I personally find it interesting to see this because it's it's not tangible. It's at the end of the day, you have nobody that you can turn to and say, I have here five bitcoins. Uh, give me some money. Yeah. With with a CDBC, I can still go to a central bank and say, I've got here five CDBCs, please give me my money back. So it's a different story. Hmm. Um, so from that point of view, I think CBDCs are something that have more potential. Um, personally, I still debate whether it is a solution looking for a problem or a problem to 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 or a solution to solve a problem. I'm not completely out on that one yet, yeah. personally, but I do believe that it has potential because a CBDC, actually, if you think about what happened in Belgium in, in the 90s, we had Proton. Yeah. You could argue that Proton was some form or shape of a CBDC, yeah. but you need a car then. But the thing is, um, it is controlled by the banking sector by the financial sector it's uh, guaranteed it has certain regulation and under those conditions i do believe that uh, it could work yeah and i think yeah one one thing to stays for me very important and for sure if you see cross-border payments for corporations and large amounts is the trust of a central bank who guarantees something in compared to it a private individual being in fintech or somebody else that is totally that the trust level is totally different to my idea so so yeah that, I, I agree with you on that one now uh coming to my last question or our last topic is is let's see five years ahead uh, where do you see the evolution of cross-border uh, payments? Where, where will it go to, to your idea? I think uh, real time will be uh, at the center uh, stage. If you look to if you if you look in over the last years, what has happened on the domestic level, moving from batch based payments to real time payments, and it's going to accelerate because everybody is moving in that direction. We live in the we want it now world, like uh, if uh, Twitter is down or if Facebook is down, we scream for hell. Well, if the payment is not happening in the next 10 minutes, people are reacting in a similar way. If I look at my kids, they, they deal with payments completely different than my parents. Yeah. So yeah. there's a clear shift happening. And if you then look at international, with the interaction between uh, clearing systems, like look what's happening with EBA and uh, the DCH in the US, they are going to integrate real-time rails from Europe with America. That means I can do a US dollar payment in the near future in real time from my Belgian uh, Euro account to a colleague's uh, US dollar account in, in the States yeah. in, below, in like 10 seconds. Yeah. And once they've done it between two clearing systems, they will, it will not stop them to do it between many clearing systems because once you have the, 
the blueprint, then it's, the rest is just copy and paste. Yeah. Now, if you look at what's happening with Swift, with uh, uh, GPI Instant, then that's similar yeah. things. So I do believe that there are enough initiatives that will make real-time payments end-to-end, cross-border, will happen. Yeah. Now, whether it will be because of the two things that I mentioned so before, or whether it will be with CDBCs, actually, that will be irrelevant, but the banking sector will do it. Yeah. And when that happens, then I'm a little bit afraid for the fintechs of this world that are working on the fringes with a very dedicated solution, but not an end to end complete yeah. solution. Where I see the fintech coming in there is the, in the embedded finance part of the frictionless part of the payment, where a bank traditionally is not a good front end uh, yeah. designer. There I see the fintechs playing in partnership with the banks, uh, like, for example, now uh, Moniz has been taken over by HSBC. You see this, this yeah, emerged. But at that point in time, it's no longer a fintech, it's a bank. Yeah, and that's right. So the banks will become have fintech hubs. Maybe some banks tried already a few years ago, but this will become more and more reality. Yeah. Guy, um, it was very nice to have you. We were already at the end of our time. I, I would like to thank you very much uh, for joining me in this episode of Payment Talks. I would like to wish you a lot of success uh, personally and in the business for the year end and, and, and a great start of 2023. Thank you for having me in this talk, Peter. Thank you very much. <laughs>